What's up everyone, Josh Rozepka here, and this past weekend I got to play two awesome gigs. Uh, I played two shows with The Temptations in Indiana, and uh, we played for two crowds, uh, Friday, Saturday night, each one a little over 6,000 people. Total blast, and it just felt so good to be playing big shows again. We were in a big outdoor pavilion, and uh, this is actually what it looked like. And you can see a lot of people out there, and I wanted to just share a little bit about this show, the process, and then uh, I had an opportunity to sit down uh, with Kenny Robinson and uh, talk to him. Now, many of you probably know him as the founder of Robinson's Remedies and a great trumpeter. Uh, however, he is also a contractor and he actually contracted all of the horns for the Temptations gig. I figured it would be fun to ask him a little bit about uh, his history with playing and he told some amazing stories of how he got to meet and then uh, become friends with and study with Maurice Andre and Bud Herseth, which was very cool to hear. And then his journey through music and becoming a contractor. And he has contracted with a lot of very well-known artists and a lot of really well-known groups. Uh, so very interesting to hear all of that. And he also shared what he does to get prepared for these types of gigs and uh, what he looks for in musicians when he is hiring as a contractor. So a very fun conversation and I'm excited to get to that in just a minute. Uh, but first, playing with The Temptations. This is the first time I ever played with The Temps and I gotta say it was a blast. And uh, I'm gonna share a little bit about what the day was like because uh, some of you might be interested in that. And uh, I was asked once years ago, a long time ago, to play a gig with The Temptations and I was already booked. So I was very happy to get that call and to be able to play these shows, not just because it was The Temptations, but you know, I am just itching to be out there playing. That's what I love doing. Plus, I got to play with two amazing trumpeters and friends, Ken Robinson and Roger Ingram. Really hard to ask for a better section than that. This is a 10 piece horn section, so a lot of firepower up on stage. So if any of you are wondering what it's like to do a gig like that, um, here is how the day went. So I got up early and drove to Indiana. It was a three and a half hour drive and I lost an hour with the time zones changing. So I had to leave pretty early in order to get there for uh, three o'clock sound check and to make sure I was there early enough to warm up and uh, check into the hotel. Since this was out of town, they booked hotel rooms for all of us and uh, rehearsal was at three o'clock and we went for about an hour and a half and then we had a little break and then we did a 45 minute sound check and then we had a little bit of a break for dinner and to just relax before the show which was at eight o'clock and we're outside and it is pretty hot outside and uh, the whole show, for me at least, I'm sight reading. Everything is sight reading, uh, an hour and 20 minutes of music, one after the next. And a lot of these charts have got pencil markings and highlighters all over, you know, kind of uh, with extra repeats or, or highlighting where the coda is and, and whatnot, just giving notes. Uh, some sections have been cut out, so you really, you really gotta be uh, paying a lot of attention and you really gotta be reading everything that is on the page. I was the only one in the band who was doing it for the first time. All the other guys in the band had played the show many times before, uh, some of them for many, many years. So I was on my toes, but also I recognized that since everyone else there had been doing this show and they've played it so many times, I was really making sure to use my ears and listen. I was listening to uh, the trumpets next to me and the trombones next to me. Everything else on stage was a little hard to hear just because of the way that everything was set up with the monitors and the wedges and the sound system. And we were kind of in the back and there were fans behind us, which was great because it was very hot out. You know, I'm just making sure I'm reading and listening. And that is so important. You gotta listen, especially when you're playing with people who've done it before. For me, I was listening to phrasing, uh, note lengths, articulations, uh, intonation, of course. I just wanted to make sure that I was blending and matching with the section, I, right? As, as best as I could, I wanted to make sure uh, that I could play this and I didn't want anyone who was listening to uh, have any inclination that this was my first time playing the show. But in the end, everything was great. Uh, we played, it sounded, it sounded really terrific and it was just a blast. Now I will add one thing. This show, man, it is off to the races. As soon as you start the show, uh, 40 minutes, 45 minutes until the first break, until it lets off at all. Every single song was 
was basically a direct segue, one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And the energy that we were that we were bringing as that 10 piece horn section and the whole band, that's why 6,000 people were coming each night to hear that type of a show. And even though I was playing third trumpet at the end of that 40 minutes, it was a well-deserved rest. And uh, we were all very glad that the singers uh, took a moment to uh, address the audience and, and kind of talk a little bit and, and share that it was the 60th anniversary tour of The Temptations. And one of the singers is the original member of The Temptations. So uh, just blew my mind that, that you could be doing the same gig for 60 years with your own band. Just absolutely incredible. Now, the second day, we did not have a rehearsal or a sound check. Uh, we just showed up and played at eight o'clock. Uh, we got there early for dinner, but earlier in the afternoon, I had an opportunity to sit down with Ken Robinson uh, at the hotel. We used one of the conference rooms and had a chance to ask him some questions. So I would like to share all of that with you because he had some awesome things to say and some amazing stories. So uh, I think you're gonna enjoy this. All right, I will see you at the end. I'm Ken Robinson, founder and president of Robinson's Remedies. I got uh, three products right now in my hand and we have Lip Renew for when musicians while they play, Lip Renew Recovery Stick, wax-free stick, for after and before and all the other times. And we have the original, what founded the company, Lip Repair for cold sore sufferers. Cold sore treatment and preventative. We have a new product for all Kane Reed users, sax players, clarinet players, oboe players. It's called Reed Renew. And what we do, we take a Kane Reed, I don't wish I had one, I don't have one, and you paint it on both sides when you're done playing. It conditions the reed to last four, five, ten times longer, some people say. I have been playing since I was in eighth grade. Uh, I started, no, maybe before that, sixth grade. I was about uh, 11 years old, I think I started playing. And I remember why I actually started playing trumpet. I was uh, in third grade and we had a general music class, right? And um, my dad's old trumpet was a con director in, in, in my closet and we were doing show and tell and music. And so I decided to bring this horn to school and show everybody. So I uh, read a book that I had on how to oil the valves and everything and I oiled the valves the night before and I tried blowing it and I couldn't really blow it. So I took it to show and tell the next day and um, I remember this well. And the teacher had, I showed, showed me, had showed the trumpet. He goes, now play it for us. And I, I didn't know how to play, but I didn't want to say I didn't know how to play, so I faked it. And I uh, started playing some notes and everybody started clapping. <laughs> so I just, so I said, I'm gonna be a trumpet player. And that was in third grade. And then I didn't start until I was in sixth grade. All I wanted to do was play trumpet. And I used to practice all the time. And uh, now I'm over 50 and been a professional trumpet player for, let's see, how, how long would that be? 40 years or something, 40, 41 years. Maurice Andre was my boyhood hero from, from a little kid. I used to listen to Maurice Andre records all the time. I had taken lessons from Jerome Callett, Jerry Callett, and uh, uh, you know, about the you know, tongue control embouchure, super chops and all that stuff. And I was, uh, went to the New York Brass Conference in 1990 or 91, something like that, and he was there. It was at the Roosevelt Hotel in New York City, and it's a Charles Colin Brass Conference. And so Maurice Andre and Jerry Callett were friends. They knew each other, you know. So he comes over and he's talking to Jerry Callett, and Jerry Callett's over there playing F's above double C and everything. And Maurice is like uh, sitting there, and he goes, "I want you to meet my student, Kenny Robinson." And Maurice could speak a little English, not much. And I had a Selmer piccolo trumpet. And uh, he saw that and he liked it. It was a silver plated one. And, um, and he said, play a low F to a high F scale, right? And I said, okay. And then um, I went, you know, low one and four. And I stopped and held the high F and, and he goes, oh, wonderful. And then he goes, listen to how, listen how Kenny can play 
play all these uh, you know, concertos and everything. And I was playing all these concertos and he was grabbing my stomach and everything <laughs> like that to see, to see how I was using my air. And that's how I met Maurice Andre. We hung out for, for four days, for the four or five days, the whole week at the brass conference. I, I have a classical background and all I was was a classical player all the way through high school. But I played in the high school jazz band and I always had, uh, you know, I could play, a, you know, pretty good high F or high G when I was in high school. But I really got into classical when I was in college. I was going to audition for all these symphony orchestras and I met Bud Herseth uh, backstage at the Chicago Symphony Radiothon when I was like, oh, let's see, how old was I? Maybe 21 or something, 20. I didn't get to take a lesson from him then. I just met him at Ravinia. If you gave a donation to the Chicago Symphony Radiothon, you could have a lesson with somebody. And the only person left was um, uh, Gene Picorni. He was the uh, tuba player at the time in the Chicago Symphony. But he introduced me to Bud, and, uh, and I talked to Bud for a little bit, and um, then I went and had a lesson with Gene Picorni on how to take auditions. So I was auditioning all the time, and then I, I was a big fan of Maynard Ferguson, right? I, I went and heard Maynard Ferguson, and I met Walter White, who's a, one of my best friends and my brand ambassador now. And then that co kind of corrupted my life. I started playing in an, <laughs> an R&B band, you know, <laughs> listening to, you know, Maynard Records and uh, uh, Miles Davis. And, uh, and then I went out on a cruise ship and played, uh, you know, uh, in the big bands on cruise ships and then started playing in big bands. and. I met Patrick Hessian and we became friends. And then he moved to Detroit, became my roommate uh, at a time. And then he went out with Maynard because I had known Ed Sargent just from going to the concerts all the time. And I got to know all the guys from Walter and, and I met Roger back way before I ever went with Maynard. And I was a repairman. So all these guys started to know me as being a repairman too. And I'm still a repairman. So there was an opening in Maynard's band, and I, uh, Patrick asked me if I wanted to go. I said yes this time, because I had been asked before, and I always say no. And I said, yeah, well, why not? You know. And my friend Reggie, uh, uh, Reggie Watkins, great trombone player, um, was the band leader at the time. So he says, "You ready to join the Big Bop Nouveau?" And I said, "Sure." <laughs> you know. And I went out there with Maynard and. Um, we were playing in Chicago. I was doing this piccolo trumpet solo that, that, that was written for me, and it was a guitar solo from the, from the Pagliacci. And we did it in the medley at the end of the night. And I thought, I, I don't think that uh, Maynard's gonna like this. And they go, oh, just play it. He's gonna love it. Just trust me, you know? And we're in rehearsal, and I said to, uh, I said to Pat, okay, I stood back there, and, May and I played it, and then Maynard stopped the band, and he goes, he looks back like this and he goes, that sounds great, what was that? And I told him, so he goes, you're gonna play that tonight at our first concert and you're gonna come up to the mic, you know? So, and then we were playing a concert in Chicago, like I was saying, and we went to a bar afterwards and uh, Maynard, and there was a trombone player that was at the concert that was hanging out with us that was a substitute in the Chicago Symphony. He said, Maynard says I should call Bud. And he goes, you should. And I said, oh, he doesn't want to hear from me. And Maynard says, uh, tell him you're a friend of mine. He's a friend, Bud's a friend of mine. You're in my band, he'll talk to you. So I called up Bud and invited him to the concert. And he couldn't come to the concert because he had other plans. But we got to talking. And uh, when I got off the road with Maynard, this is the second tour now. Um, may, uh, I got a hold of Bud, he came to uh, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and I went up and talked to him, he goes, I've talked to you on the phone before, and we got to be friends. Then uh, Maynard passed away, and uh, I was in the middle of making my second CD, my second classical CD, so I decided to do a, um, a tribute to Maynard on it. Instead of, instead of me playing Maynard tunes, uh, I decided to do it in the classical style as a real tribute to him. So I had an arrangement of um, Lucy Odala's, I think it was called, uh, yeah, Lucy Odala a Caruso, which Maynard used to play on the flugelhorn with piano. And he loved Andrea Bocelli, the, uh, the, the, 
the, all the great tenors. He loved that music. So he used to play it on the flugelhorn. It, it was so good, it made you want to cry sometimes. So I did an arrangement for uh, uh, eight trumpets and pipe organ and, and uh, uh, you know, antiphonally uh, of Lucy O'Dala's uh, Caruso. And it has the ghost of Maynard in the middle of it and a surprise ending at the end. Anyways, I asked Bud Herseth to be a part of it and he was thrilled to be a part of it. And I went to his house and we, we had this little party room like we have right here. And uh, my studio guy uh, went to Chicago with me and set up uh, his, uh, his ribbon mics and everything. And Bud had his headphones on and he recorded on a rotary trumpet. And um, then I spent the whole day with him and uh, uh, he invited me for sushi and then uh, we sat around and played trumpets all day. And then he says, come back anytime. And, uh, and we became really good friends. We used to talk once a week, at least, until he died. And I have been to Chicago many times and just hung out with him and studied. He never charged me for anything and just, just used to give me all kinds of advice and, and, uh, and then ask my advice how to play high notes. And I go, Bud, how old are you? And he goes, well, I'm 86 but I can't play a loud double C. Never <laughs> <laughs> told me that once. He goes, I can play it, but it's not very loud. And I said, you know, you're 86 years old, right? I I'd be lucky to, to, to live to be that old, right? But he had a great life and his wife, uh, Avis, was even older than him. And they met in the third grade. He told me, he told me all kinds. I he just learned so much about life from him. I've been contracting since probably the, uh, 2005. I started with Dennis Edwards. Uh, Dennis Edwards and the Temptations Review, they were called. Dennis was um, a, a later singer that uh, uh, you know replaced uh, David Ruffin, I do believe, um, back in the 60s. They got their first Grammy when Dennis joined the group because that was he sang Papa Was a Rolling Stone, you know, hit Cloud Nine. Psychedelic Shack, all, all those really, really great 60s tunes, later 60s, uh, you know, early 70s. And then I got a call from um, uh, George Roundtree, and he was the music director of the Four Tops, the Motown group, the Four Tops, and he used 10 horns, and he uh, was very uh, a stickler about, about everything, but great music director. Uh, so then I started contracting with the Four Tops and the Temptations because they would do shows together, which they still do. And then I met uh, a guy named um, Al McKenzie, but then he left the group. And then uh, I met a guy named Bob Farrell. Uh, he was the director of the uh, Temptations, and we got to be friends, so I started booking them. And then I got a call one day uh, from a friend of mine uh, named Dennis Williams, Doc Dennis Williams. And he's not a Motown guy, but he's with the OJs. And I started playing with the OJs and I still play with them. And then one time I got a call from, uh, oh, I think back in 2010, maybe 2009, I got a call from a guy named H.B. Barnum. H.B. Barnum is the famed music director for the Aretha Franklin. And she's not Motown either. But H.B. Barnum lived, uh, grew up in L.A., and he was Katy Perry's next-door neighbor. And the guy's uh, in his 80s now, and you ask him how old he is on his birthday, he always goes, 21! And he's just a happy guy, and he's a great music director. And uh, I, started, I started with him, and, until, and then uh, Fred Nelson took over after he had to take a leave of absence, and then she uh, died of cancer. I was the contractor for the whole band at uh, her uh, funeral. We were there all day on TV. People were texting me from Europe and going, I'm looking at you on TV. And uh, all these news organizations were there. We had to park uh, miles away, and there was a bus that came and got us. And, uh, and they were really, really tight on the security. And because they, they had President Bill Clinton there and Hillary Clinton and uh, Al Sharpton and uh, uh, Eric Holder and all these political figures. And what I did is I got a, a band of people that played with her, with me, a lot from different cities. And we didn't make a cent. 
but we did it. It was a, it was a, it was, and they had these programs and they had us in the program and they had me in the program. And then I was looking on eBay, I got a few of these programs and they were selling for $10,000, these programs on eBay. I never sold my programs, but uh, I couldn't imagine they were selling for $10,000 for like the, for the first week. And then you probably couldn't give them away now. But, uh, you know, HB was there. Fred Nelson was the director at the time from Chicago. It was, it was uh, definitely a day. Let me tell you something about contracting. You know, people go, oh, you're the contractor, you know, but it's a lot of work. You, it's it's, it's a, a tremendous amount of responsibility, way more than I thought I was getting into when I started doing it. And that's why, you know, I, I always wondered why, you know, contractors made so much more money. Well, because they, they have to, they have to, you know, sometimes they, I have to get hotel rooms. A lot of times I got to get hotel rooms. I got to, I got to get routes. I got to get, uh, I got to get people their meal tickets. I got to tell, tell people what they're going to play. I got to tell people when to be at rehearsal. I got to, I have to answer for the music director. It's, it's, it's a, it's a lot of work. Sometimes I wish that, uh, a contractor would just call me and I just have to show up and play. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But you learn how to um, work with promoters and you, you learn about a lot more about the music industry management side of, of, of being a musician. And then playing the gig too is, is puts a lot extra pressure on yourself. So a lot of times I won't even play lead on a gig that I'm contracting on because I have to worry about everything else. But uh, sometimes I play lead like I'm gonna do tonight. And you're on the gig with me. First of all, you played the show last night. Uh, so you know how challenging it is and it just keeps on moving. It's just one after the other and it's a lot of FaceTime, right? And it's loud on stage and it's, uh, there's 10 horns and it's always in the meat register, always around, you know, C in the staff, to high C, high D, high E. And I'm playing lead tonight. And um, so how I prepare for a gig like this is uh, I do a lot of long tones. And it's all about endurance, right? And this is where Lip Renew comes in. I, I, I do my long tones and I use my Lip Renew. People say, oh, I don't need that. But I say, give it a try because what it does is, it, is in between long tone sets, I, I do 20 minute sets of long tones along with uh, Walter White's long tone CDs. I'll get up to, I'll do a set, uh, you know, a week before the gig, like one set and then two sets the next day and then three sets the next day and then four sets the next day and, and until I get up to seven sets throughout the day. But you have to rest as much as you play. And it's, it's like, a, it's like a, a bodybuilder, you know, uh, building up their, uh, you know, their endurance. Your muscles have a memory, right? And uh, what happens is uh, you get used to playing like that and playing efficiently and teaches you about breathing and teaches you, you can focus on your sound because you're just playing long tones, right? And different registers. And the higher you go, the more you rest. And then you do one set, the seventh set, um, you do cooling down, all right? And then you rest the next day, don't play anything and then you warm up nice and easy on the gig day and you're unstoppable. That's what I found out. You know, we did a rehearsal yesterday, 90 minute rehearsal. Then we did what, a 45 minute sound check and then dinner and then an hour and a half show almost. And I was tired, I was done at the end of the gig, but hey, we got through it. During the gig, I'll use it because like when I, when I get a break, I, I put it on my lips and I put it inside my lips. You know, on the inside, because you could, uh, it, it, it uh, soaks into the muscles, right? And I put it on, on my cheeks and my buccinators and everything, my buccinators and my orbiculus oris. And you rub it in and you let, you feel this cooling effect. And I rub it on the inside of my chops too, around the gum line and everything. And it, it brings the swelling down, but more importantly, it keeps the lactic acid out and it's got a vasodilator that opens up the blood vessels. It's just, it's just science and physiology is what it is. And then after the gig, I use this. And it's no wax in it. And 
It, it does the same thing as this, except it's an extended release. And I, I really say it's important to use it because if I didn't have that tool, hey, yeah, I could get through it, but it, it's a lot more comfortable to get through it. And it's all about comfort and efficiency. And because when you play easy, you sound better and relaxed. You don't have to worry about it so much. Yeah. Because gigs are hard. The demands on trumpet players these days are on brass players, you know? They're getting harder and harder and harder. When I hire somebody that's never played the book before, like yourself, um, I, I look for, uh, you know, musicianship, not afraid to read chicken scratch because, you know, you saw so much pencil. There's so much pencil. These arrangements need to be redone, but they'll never be redone. You should have seen, you should have seen Aretha's book. It was like the pages, you'd pick them up and, and, and the corner would fall off. And you go, <laughs> when are they going to rewrite this? You know, and they never did. So I look for, uh, you know, an open mind, somebody that can listen, somebody that's adaptable, and, so, and somebody that I feel that would do a good job. That's, that's what I look for. And you are all the above and more. All right, well, that was very kind of Candace say. And uh, like I said, I had a blast playing that show, and I can't wait for the next one. And I really enjoyed hearing everything that he had to say. What a cool history. And for any of you that are watching this, that are in college, that are in high school, uh, you know, you never know where your path is gonna take you. He was a classical trumpet player. He was studying classical music. He was classically trained. And then he did that cruise gig. And then he started playing in rock bands. And well, before he knew it, he was on the road with Maynard Ferguson, and now he's contracting for The Temptations, The Four Tops, for all these groups that he's playing with. He played with Aretha for so many years. Really just so fascinating and so interesting. So a big thanks to Ken for taking the time and sitting down with me and sharing some stories and uh, answering some questions. Very, very cool. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, let me know in the comments below. And while you're at it, why don't you hit that like button and subscribe. It really makes a very big difference. I want to thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.